All right, welcome back. Today we're continuing our review of our third BCBA practice exam, where we're going through the next 10 questions and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. If you're looking for this exam, plus our other two, please check out bcbastudy.com. We also offer a full task list study guide, flashcards, and our combo pack, which includes everything. As always, questions, comments, let us know. Work hard, study hard. Let's get to our questions. James is a good student and well-behaved, but he will often fall asleep in class. Miss Tracy will now pra praise James every five minutes unless he starts to fall asleep. Miss Tracy is implementing what? Okay, differential reinforcement question. And we're looking at what Miss Tracy is doing in regards to James's behavior. So we know James will often fall asleep in class, which seems to be our target behavior. Miss Tracy praises James every five minutes unless he starts to fall asleep. And the key word here is unless. What differential reinforcement procedure reinforces in the absence of a behavior? If we're looking at a DRL, we're trying to reduce the amount of times something is happening. DRH is the opposite. We're trying to increase the amount of times something is happening. We're not trying to increase James's behavior here. DRI, we're teaching a replacement behavior, an incompatible behavior, with, let's say, sleeping. But in this case, we're not teaching a replacement behavior. We're simply praising James if he doesn't fall asleep. So in the absence of the behavior, we're using a DRO, a differential reinforcement procedure of other behaviors. The key to identifying a DRO procedure is identifying when you're reinforcing in the absence of a, the target behavior. So our target behavior is falling asleep when target, when falling asleep is not occurring, that's when we're reinforcing. We're not teaching replacement. We're not lower. We're not higher. We're reinforcing in the absence of the behavior. Another way to describe escape maintained behavior would be what? Now, escape maintained behavior would be when a client or a learner engages in a behavior and is able to get away from something. So, the most common example would be work, right? Schoolwork. So we have homework, let's say. And if we do 10 problems, we can go and play on our Xbox. Okay. Escape, maintain behavior. Now, the more maladaptive version might be throwing a tantrum to get out of homework. Either way, what is occurring? Well, something is being removed. We're escaping from something and that is increasing and maintaining our behavior. So if our behavior is being maintained, is it being punished or reinforced? Well, of course, it's being reinforced. Reinforcement increases or maintains our behavior. So we can eliminate negative punishment. It's not automatic behavior. We're looking at negative or positive reinforcement. So we know it's reinforcement. And if it's escape, what's happening? Something is being removed. Task demand is being removed. A stimulus is being removed. We're removing something. And when we remove something, what is it called? Well, negative. So we're removing negative something that's maintaining reinforcing behavior. So escape, maintain behavior is also considered negative reinforcement. Just something you should know regardless, but you can see how we can easily break it down to get there. Question three, this type of preference assessment is best at determining a hierarchy of preference. Now, this one confuses a lot of people. Many, many people want to choose multiple stimulus as the answer here. What we're trying to do is determine a hierarchy. So if we have five items, we want to be able to put those items from one to five as far as preference goes. And the only way we can do that is if we compare each item to every other item. The issue we have with multiple stimulus with and without replacement is we're not actually comparing each item to all the other items. Multiple stimulus with replacement, whatever item is chosen is put back, but the other items are changed. So we're still not comparing them to each other. Multiple stimulus without replacement, we're just picking an item and removing it, leaving the other four. Now, technically, you could get a hierarchy with the without replacement or the with replacement. It's just not going to be as effective as a forced choice. And the reason being is if we have five items and we compare A and B, then we'll compare B and C, then C and D, then D and E, and we're going to do that and compare every single item to the other items in our array. 
It's just a much more effective way of looking at preferences for the individual items compared to the other items. Now, this is what the literature says regardless. So even if you still think multiple stimulus is better, the literature indicates forced choice is the best at determining hierarchy. Again, with multiple stimulus, we're changing up the array constantly. We're not really continuously evaluating stimuli versus stimuli, right? Force choice, we have to compare each and every one systematically until we get a true indicator of, okay, they prefer this one this many times, this one this many times, this one this many times. So don't forget, okay, the, the best type of preference assessment to determine a hierarchy is going to be force choice. A BCBA specializing in OBM is hired by a car dealership to evaluate their staff's performance and increase productivity using behavior analytic techniques. The first thing the BCBA wants to do is familiarize herself with the dealership itself and the associated environment. What type of assessment should she use? All right, wordy question. Remember, what is our strategy? We are going to tackle the question first. Make sure we understand the question before we get into the answer choices. So let's break it down. We're looking for the type of assessment this BCBA should use. We know she's OBM, so business management, hired by a dealership to evaluate staff's performance. But what does the BCBA want to do? She wants to familiarize herself with the dealership itself and the associated environment. So immediately, immediately, let's eliminate indirect. Let's eliminate interview the manager of the dealership. She wants to familiarize herself with the dealership itself and the associated environment. Interviewing the manager is not going to be, be the best way to do that. The manager is going to be biased. She's not going to get a firsthand account of what she's looking for. Eliminate indirect. Now, functional analysis. With the functional analysis, we're not really looking at the associated environment, the dealership. We're looking at the individuals and the function of their behavior. That's not what she's focused on right now. She's looking at everything around the staff she's supposed to be working with. So it leaves us with a direct assessment and an ecological assessment. Now, this is where we have to pick the best answer. Absolutely, a direct assessment would be the assessment she should use, right? She should directly evaluate the environment in the dealership. However, the better answer is going to be ecological assessment because it's much more specific. An ec ecological assessment looks at the surrounding environment of the learner, or in this case, the staff. Is an ecological assessment direct? It sure is, but an ecological assessment is the better answer. It's more specific. It's more precise. That's why we never, ever only read one or two answer choices. We always read all of our answer choices to ensure, to guarantee we're picking the best possible answer. You could have stopped a direct assessment but you would have missed it. Is an ecological assessment direct? It is, but ecological assessment is much more specific to what we're actually trying to accomplish, which is evaluating the environment around the staff. So what type of assessment should she use? C, ecological assessment. Miss Cindy has 30 kids in her classroom. She wants to use a token economy to maintain and increase behavior. She designs the token boards, designs the tokens, and picks three potential backup reinforcers from a list she found on the internet for the entire class to choose from. These reinforcers will be available on an FR3 schedule. Miss Cindy is going to implement the token economy on Monday. What did Miss Cindy do incorrectly? All right. So here is a question about a token economy. We have 30 kids in the classroom, and we're looking at what Miss Cindy did incorrectly. She wants to use this token economy to maintain and increase behavior. Designs the token boards, fine. Designs the tokens, fine. Three potential backup reinforcers from a list she found on the internet from the entire class to choose from. Now, is this really going to be the best way to approach our backup reinforcers? Well, no. Why would we use a list? When we have the kids in the classroom right there, why not conduct a preference assessment with the kids? The only way the token economy works is if our backup reinforcers are actually reinforcing. And to be reinforcing, they need typically to be go through a preference assessment first. So finding just this list you found on the internet is not going to be the most empirical way to determine backup reinforcers. So what did Miss Cindy do incorrectly? 
A, she set the price of the backup reinforcers too high to start. Unclear, right? And FR3 is not really that high, right? It's just unclear if that's too high to start. That seems pretty low, but we don't know how it's affecting the kids, so we can't say for sure the price is too high. B, she should have conducted a functional analysis on each child before implementing the token economy. That doesn't seem feasible for 30 kids to conduct full functional analyses on each child before implementing the token economy. Sometimes with this many kids, you have to make do. You have to work with what you have, resources and time. Conducting a functional analysis before the token economy doesn't seem feasible, doesn't seem necessary. C, her preference assessment is based on indirect data. Yes, that's the problem, right? She picks three potential backup reinforcers from a, a, from a list she found on the internet. So all she's doing is, is going on the internet and saying, okay, what do kids like? Instead of actually asking the kids in her classroom. Now, could she get lucky? Sure. I'm sure she picked iPad. Most kids would like that. But it's still not the way we should be doing this if we're really going to want a token economy to work. You can do a preference assessment very quickly, unlike a functional analysis. And then D, she should choose at least five backup reinforcers. Nope. Three potential to start is fine. Now, as the responses increase, she can certainly add more, but three is fine to start. The problem is this list she found on the internet for the entire class. Her preference assessment is based on indirect data. We want everything to be based on direct data. Indirect data is fine as long as you pair it with direct data. Verbal behavior in ABA is focused on what aspect of the behavior. When Skinner was talking about verbal operants, when he developed verbal behavior in ABA, what is he focused on? What's what we're focused on across all ABA, right? In ABA, what are we concerned with? We're concerned with the environment, the environment on the effects on the learner, and why is the behavior occurring? We're concerned with the why. So verbal behavior is the same way. Verbal behavior is focused on a function. Now, do we pick function and move on? No, we always read all of our answer choices. B, form. Well, form and topography are essentially the same thing. It's how it looks. And as we know, behavior can look one way and function a very different way. Form and topography matter, but they're not what we're focused on. We're focused on the reason the verbal behavior is occurring. Are we labeling? Are we requesting? Are we having a conversation? And then magnitude. Magnitude is intensity or level. So speech volume would be magnitude. Again, important, right? We should be aware of it. But what we're really focused on is why it's occurring. So as always in every behavior in ABA, we're really focused on the function first and then the topography and magnitude. Which is the following. Basic reinforcement schedules produces a scallop effect. Now, this is one of the most commonly asked questions across all preparations and classes and everything, okay? The scallop effect is when we have kind of a flat line, and then all of a sudden, our responses jump up big time. It produces this low hump almost, okay? So what reinforcement schedule produces this? Well, for a scallop effect, we need a period of non-response and then a rapid amount of responses in a short amount of time, okay? So typically, that's going to occur, right, with a fixed interval schedule. Because with a fixed interval, let's say we have a fixed interval of five minutes. No matter how many times the client responds, they're only going to receive reinforcement every five minutes. And if they figure that out, then they're going to wait till the end of that interval to start responding. So I might not respond for the first four and a half minutes, and that last 30 seconds might see a huge increase in the number of responses. You should just know this in general, but that is the idea behind it. So which of the following basic reinforcement schedule produces a scallop effect? It's going to be C, fixed interval. Four friends are at the first tee box on the golf course. They make a deal that if all four of them are able to hit their balls into the middle of the fairway, they do not have to take a shot. What type of contingency is this? We have a group contingency working here. We have four people, all contingent on a, on a behavior of hitting the ball into the middle of the fairway. So are we looking at a dependent group, independent, or interdependent? Well, we know a dependent, our hero procedure, we're dependent on one person in the group or a small subset of the group. Independent, everybody's responsible for their own behavior. 
interdependent. Everyone needs to complete the contingency. So what do we say here? Well, they make a deal that if all four of them hit their balls in the middle of the fairway, they don't have to take a shot. So are we relying on one person? No. Are we relying on just ourselves? No. We are relying on the entire group. The entire group has to hit the ball into the middle of the fairway or else they don't meet the contingency. So when we're relying on an entire group, we are interdependent. So what type of contingency is this? It's going to be an interdependent group contingency. Don't miss group contingency questions. They're pretty simple. Just study them, devote a little time to them. Don't miss these questions. If you're going to explain positive punishment to a parent, which of the following explanations would be best? What is our goal when explaining things to non-ABA practitioners, to naive learners, to people who don't understand the lingo? As BCBAs, we avoid jargon and we avoid technical language. We're not there to show off how smart we are and how much we know. We want to explain it in a way they'll understand. That's our only goal. So we want to explain positive punishment. Now, in your head, just think about how would you explain to your friend who knows nothing about positive punishment as ABA goes and probably has a different idea of what punishment is. Well, I would just say, well, we're adding things to decrease behavior. Very simply, okay? So let's look at what explanation will be best. A, we're going to start adding or removing things to try and decrease the behavior. What's the problem here? Well, we're looking at positive punishment. We're saying we're going to add and remove things. We're not removing anything, right? We're just adding stuff to decrease the behavior. B, we're going to start adding minutes to the clock, which will hopefully decrease the behavior. Okay, we have adding minutes, so we have it positive. Decrease, we have punishment. This is pretty good, right? Now, what do you mean by positive punishment? Well, simply we're going to add some minutes to the clock, and as we add minutes, hopefully the behavior decreases. Positive punishment. Pretty good. What about C? Each time the behavior occurs, remove a star. This will help decrease the behavior. We have decrease, which is punishment, but removal is negative. D, punishment will help decrease the behavior while teaching your son what to do instead. Does punishment teach replacement behaviors? It does not. A good treatment plan has a additional intervention to teach replacement behaviors. Punishment does not do it. So the best way to explain positive punishment would be B. We start adding minutes positive to the clock, which will hopefully decrease punishment, the behavior. And then which of the following is not an example of a transcription? So what is a transcription? Essentially taking notes. Verbal SD, write down what you hear, right? Transcribe what we hear. So writing down a phone number that has spoken to you. Definitely a transcription. Taking notes in class. Absolutely. Writing down everything that is said during a meeting. Sure. Typing out a recipe that you read on the internet. No. You read on the internet. Okay. That nonverbal SD. We're not transcribing it. Okay. We're just copying it. Right. So transcriptions have to do with verbal SDs. So which of the following is not an example of transcription? B. Typing out a recipe you read on the internet. All right, thanks for watching. We'll be back with our next video soon. Check out bcbastudy.com for all of our study materials. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.